So the uh, learning objectives are to recognize how current guidelines, um, cur current guideline recommendations lead to underestimation of atrial stenosis severity during atrial fibrillation, and we'll spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about that because I think this is important. We'll identify the consequences of underestimating atrial stenosis in patients with atrial fibrillation, and then recognize the impact of atrial fibrillation in the TAVR uh, patients. <clears throat> so the criteria for severe atrial valve stenosis are shown here. Peak velocity of four meters per second usually goes with the mean gradient of 40 millimeters of mercury, so velocity of four and a gradient of 40, that is severe aortic valve stenosis until proven otherwise. This usually occurs in a setting of a small aortic valve area less than one, or when indexed to body surface area less than 0 0.6 centimeter, uh, square centimeter per square uh, meter. There's also this uh, measurement called a dimensionless index, which is a ratio of the velocity in the left ventricular outflow tract to that uh, across the aortic valve. And anything 25.25 uh, or 25% or less is considered severe aortic valve stenosis. So, you know, you cannot call severe AS just based on the small aortic valve area alone, but you can based on a high gradient. Okay, so if you have a, just a small aortic valve area, then you need to, you know, show more that the patient indeed does have severe aortic valve stenosis. Now, the uh, guidelines recommend averaging of three or more beats in a patient in sinus rhythm, so three mean gradients for a patient in sinus rhythm, <clears throat> and then averaging, averaging of more beats is mandatory in patients with irregular rhythms such as atrial fibrillation, so you have to average five or more uh, mean gradients in a patient with atrial fibrillation. And special care must be taken to select representative sequences of beats and to avoid post-extrasystolic beats. Now, this is based on an assumption that averaging three or five mean gradients is better than one mean gradient, say the highest mean gradient or the lowest mean gradient. And the problem, of course, with assumptions is in the very definition of the word assumption, which is a thing that is accepted as true without proof. There's rationale to average for other things, but there's no direct evidence that averaging signals is better for patients in aortic valve stenosis. So the mean gradient across the aortic valve is determined by, by the aortic valve area. So the smaller the aortic valve area gets, the higher the mean gradient uh, gets across the aortic valve. But for that gradient to go up appropriately, commensurate with the de de decrease in aortic valve area, you need to have normal flow across the aortic valve. Now it turns out that atrial fibrillation is a lower flow state compared to sinus rhythm uh, for reasons listed here. There's loss of atrial kick, uh, so loss of atrial contribution to left ventricular filling, irregularly irregular cycle lengths, and there's actually reduced cardiac power in a patient with atrial fibrillation. So the forward flow in a patient with atrial fibrillation is much lower than that in a patient in sinus rhythm for the same ejection fraction. Um, and so the mean gradient may be underestimated compared to sinus rhythm. For, for the same small valve area, the mean gradient in a patient with atrial fibrillation would be lower than in a patient in sinus rhythm, okay, for the same ejection fraction. Now, here's an example of a case of a patient had chronic atrial fibrillation and aortic stenosis. 68-year-old male referred to the valve clinic for evaluation of aortic valve stenosis, has known chronic persistent atrial fibrillation, noted significant decline in his exercise tolerance over the last six months, and the physical examination was consistent with severe aortic valve stenosis, and so the patient was sent to the echo lab for further evaluation of his aortic valve. Patient is in atrial fibrillation, uh, LV size and systolic function are normal. This ejection fraction was estimated at 60 to 65%. But you can see the aortic valve is really uh, calcified with limited opening. So it looks like severe aortic valve stenosis in the parasternal long axis. And then in the short axis, you can see again restricted um, calcified valves. Now you can say, well, I'm not seeing the left one that well, so I don't know how severe this is. But you know, everything else points to uh, severe aortic valve stenosis except the mean gradient was only 21 millimeters of mercury across the aortic valve, and that's because he had low flow. The stroke volume index less than 35 is considered low flow, even though the aortic valve, valve error was way less than one, the mean gradient was just 21. So the final impression was that the patient had moderate aortic valve stenosis. You know, the gradient's only 21. We cannot get anything higher. Uh, but the clinician disagreed with the echo diagnosis, basically, and got a CT calcium um, a score, aortic valve calcium score, which is another measure of severity of aortic valve stenosis. So the higher the calcium burden, the higher the, um, uh, the worse the stenosis. And the threshold in men is about 2,000, and this patient's aortic valve calcium score was 2,800. 
consistent with severe valve stenosis. So he underwent uh, aortic valve replacement and improved. So the clinical exam and the calcium score disagreed with the echo uh, cardiogram. Now, how does the gradient in atrial fibrillation compare to that in sinus rhythm in the same uh, patient? So we've seen some of these patients where we image them during a change in rhythm. So once they're in atrial fibrillation, another time in sinus rhythm, or sinus rhythm and then atrial fibrillation. So this is a 73-year-old female, <clears throat> known aortic valve stenosis and atrial fibrillation, undergoes cardioversion three months after the baseline transthoracic echocardiogram. Baseline, this is a 2D still picture of the aortic valve, looks heavily calcified. In atrial fibrillation, forward flow was low, and then the average mean gradient was 37 millimeters of mercury. But in that average was a high mean gradient of 49 millimeters of mercury. Patient was cardioverted to sinus rhythm. The forward stroke volume improved to 47, so up from 31 to 47, and the main gradient went up to 62 millimeters of mercury. Okay? So this is what the guidelines are recommending that we do right now in the assessment of patients with aortic stenosis, and we think we probably should be using the highest mean gradient. In fact, we're convinced that we should be using the highest, single highest mean gradient, recognizing that the single highest mean gradient during atrial fibrillation may not be as high as the mean gradient that you get when the patient is in sinus rhythm. Okay, so gross underestimation of aortic valve stenosis uh, in patients in atrial fibrillation. So if atrial fibrillation is associated with low flow and low flow underestimates aortic valve uh, severity, then atrial fibrillation underestimates aortic stenosis severity. So if A equals B, B equals C, then A surely must equal uh, C. So we looked at this further um, in sort of the universe of uh, patients with small aortic valve areas and a normal ejection fraction divided them by uh, rhythm and gradient and found really a very high prevalence of severe aortic valve stenosis in low flow state associated with atrial fibrillation. And the uh, supporting data for that, again, was in this calcium scores. So if we break down patients by sinus rhythm high gradient aortic stenosis, AFib high gradient, sinus rhythm low gradient, AFib low gradient. And if you take the calcium scores and compare them to this sort of classic sinus rhythm high gradient aortic stenosis patients, you find that in the calcium scores of patients with AFib high gradient aortic stenosis, those calcium scores are much higher than the classic high gradient AS. Sinus rhythm low gradient aortic stenosis has much lower calcium scores than sinus rhythm high gradient AS. And atrial fibrillation low gradient AS has the same calcium scores as sinus rhythm high gradient aortic stenosis. Okay? So then if you ask the question, well, how often do these calcium scores meet criteria for severe aortic valve stenosis? So if the threshold in women is 1,200 or 1,300, and in men it's 2,000, how often do these aortic valve calcium scores meet criteria for severe AS? That uh, percentage is 79% in those with sinus rhythm high gradient AS. It's 87% in AFib high gradient AS. It's 48% in sinus rhythm low gradient AS, which is significantly lower than your classic you know, uh, high gradient AS. And in patients with atrial fibrillation low gradient AS, that number is 83%. Okay, so this effectively is severe aortic valve stenosis. And reliance on the Doppler mean gradients in these patients really uh, leads to underestimation of severity. So then uh, we took that further and looked in the, uh, in the TAVA population. Is there evidence of underestimation of aortic stenosis severity in patients with atrial fibrillation undergoing TAVA? And this was sort of an ideal population because everyone gets a calcium score as part of their evaluation for TAVA, and everyone has an echo uh, cardiogram. <clears throat> so then if we look at this aortic valve calcium score to mean gradient ratio, it should be the same in a patient in atrial fibrillation versus sinus rhythm. If the mean gradient is telling you the same thing and the calcium scores are telling you the same thing, then there should be no difference in a patient in atrial fibrillation and a patient in sinus rhythm. But when you look at this ratio, it was much higher in patients with atrial fibrillation compared to patients in sinus rhythm, meaning that for the same mean gradient, the aortic valve calcium score is way, way higher in patients with atrial fibrillation than in patients in uh, sinus rhythm. This is true in men with high gradient aortic stenosis, in women with high gradient aortic stenosis, as well as men with uh, low gradient uh, aortic stenosis, and we couldn't see that uh, difference in, in women with uh, low gradient aortic stenosis. But for the most part, this is what happens. The mean gradient uh, 
is much higher, um, or the ARVF calcium score is much higher for, for the same mean gradient in patients in, in AFib compared to sinus rhythm. So then we published that in uh, JACE, dopamine gradient is discordant to atrial valve calcium scores in patients with atrial fibrillation undergoing transcatheter atrial valve replacement. And for high gradient AFib, whose gradient was like 48 and the sinus rhythm were 50 or something like this, the, the absolute calcium score was actually much higher in men with high gradient and atrial fibrillation than their counterparts in, in sinus rhythm. So not only is the ratio higher, but the absolute score in some of these patients is much higher. Now, we also looked at outcomes in uh, TAVR, post-TAVR, and a lot of people have, look, have looked at this, um, that atrial fibrillation um, is a poor prognosticator following TAVR, so there's increased mortality post-TAVR in atrial fibrillation versus sinus rhythm. And this particular data set, you know, this was adjusted for age, sex, and comorbidity index and the independent determinants of increased mortality were lower um, forward flow and higher NT pro BNP in patients with atrial fibrillation. And we also saw that outcomes in persistent atrial fibrillation were worse than in patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. But again, you know, a lot of studies have shown the same thing, that outcomes are worse in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation versus um, uh, sinus rhythm. So this is current practice, right? This is current best practice. So we are underestimating aortic stenosis severity during atrial fibrillation. We misdiagnose severe AS as moderate or moderate severe. There's late diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis in patients with atrial fibrillation, which leads to late and less frequent referral to transcatheter aortic valve replacement or SAVR. And the aortic valve stenosis is way more advanced at the time of aortic valve replacement in, in patients with atrial fibrillation compared to those in sinus rhythm and the outcomes post-TAVR in patients with atrial fibrillation are worse compared to those in sinus rhythm. And really the crux of the issue is here, right? So this is a Doppler, a continuous wave Doppler signal, velocities and mean gradients across the atrial valve in a patient in atrial fibrillation. Note the variability in the magnitude of the signal because of this irregular, irregular cycle length and impaired cardiac function. So the guidelines want us to average five of these in a row instead of taking the single highest one. So if you look at this, you know, less than two, there's no aortic valve stenosis over two meters per second. Maybe that's mild AS, and then the patient is also severe AS, so all in five beats. No aortic stenosis, mild aortic stenosis, and severe aortic valve stenosis. So we think the question shouldn't be what the, great, what the average is over five consecutive beats, but it should be, is there evidence of severe aortic valve stenosis, yes or no, right? So if yes, based on a single highest mean gradient, then that patient has severe aortic valve stenosis and because these are your other words for signal, right? Is there a sign? Is there an indicator? Is there a warning sign that the patient has severe aortic valve stenosis? Is there a hint, right? Take a hint and go with that because the patient is severe, yes, if they have a single high signal. So for recommendations for clinical practice when you go home on, on Monday, take the single highest aortic valve Doppler signal for estimation of hemodynamic severity of aortic stenosis, and think severe aortic valve stenosis when faced with low gradient aortic stenosis, especially when associated with uh, atrial fibrillation. So we already talked about how bad the outcomes are in patients with pre-existing atrial fibrillation when finally they go to TAVR. Afterwards, they don't do that well. And it turns out that for patients with new onset atrial fibrillation following TAVR, the outcomes are even worse, right? So higher risk of mortality in those patients, higher bleeding rates, higher stroke rates, and higher heart failure uh, rates. And it's probably related to the um, clinical and procedural predictors of uh, new onset atrial fibrillation following TAVR. So older age, sicker patients, uh, comorbidities, low ejection fraction, uh, hemodynamic instability during TAVA, procedural complications like pericardial effusion, needing pericardial synthesis, and all of that. So these are predictors of new onset atrial fibrillation post uh, TAVA. And we had a robust uh, discussion yesterday about management of patients in uh, atrial fibrillation or patients with atrial fibrillation. And I think it's just harder to initiate and maintain some of these therapies in these high-risk patients following TAVR when they have new onset atrial fibrillation, which probably explains why the outcomes are much worse in those with new onset atrial fibrillation than those with established 
uh, atrial fibrillation. And these, of course, are your issues in a patient with atrial fibrillation, stroke prevention, rate control, and then rhythm control. And Kevin already alluded to these issues with risk of uh, pacemaker, needing a pacemaker. So all of this is, is really uh, difficult. In a patient who just bled, you know, when do you start DOAX or vitamin K antagonists, and how long do you keep them on, and, and so forth. <clears throat> now, complicating that, uh, before we stop here, are the uh, recommendations from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association valve uh, guideline, guideline on the management of patients with valve uh, disease. So just like uh, Kevin said, you know, TAV or TAV is not for everyone. There are certain patients that are better served with surgical aortic valve replacement than transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And uh, guidelines under concurrent cardi cardiac conditions favoring SAVA versus TAVR, they list atrial fibrillation as one of those conditions where maybe you should think about surgery instead of TAVR so you can do your maze procedure you can fix the mitral valve and tricuspid valve. And that's another thing we didn't talk about is sort of the associated structural heart diseases in patients with atrial fibrillation. They have mitral regurgitation, tricuspid valve regurgitation. So you can fix all of that and then maybe do a left atrial appendage ligation uh, uh, procedure. Uh, but again, you know, these patients are elderly and have comorbidities and everyone wants, you know, sort of the minimal invasive way of doing things rather than um, uh, open heart surgery. So in summary, uh, patients with atrial fibrillation uh, and challenges in a TAVR patient. So atrial fibrillation is associated with lower flow or is a low flow state compared to sinus rhythm. There's underestimation of aortic stenosis severity and, and the attendance sequelae that we talked about. There's usually associated structural heart diseases in, a patients, with, in patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, lots of mitral regurgitation, lots of functional tricuspid valve regurgitation, RV dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension in patients with AFib. And uh, all of that also contributes to low forward flow and also worse outcomes uh, following TAVR versus sinus rhythm. The burden of atrial fibrillation matters, uh, where paroxysm of atrial fibrillation, the outcomes there are better than in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. We didn't talk about the type of AF, but also the type of atrial fibrillation matters. As you know, we break this down now into valvular atrial fibrillation versus non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So for patients that have you know, concomitant mitral stenosis or have had mitral valve surgery, mitral valve replacement before, those patients, the outcome in those patients is worse than in other patients that have sort of non-valvular uh, atrial fibrillation. And then, of course, the guidelines would say maybe consider surgical aortic valve replacement rather than TAVR uh, in a patient with uh, aortic valve um, uh, with uh, atrial fibrillation. And with that, I will stop. And thank you. <laughs>